I'm head of external affairs here at the museum, and I really want to welcome you all to this program. I know some of you have been here kind of throughout the day for different member programs, so thank you for sticking it out. And those of you just joining us, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I am here to introduce our speaker, Urshula Bardor, uh, and there are several different ways I could introduce Urshula. I've had the pleasure of working with her for maybe about 10 years now-ish, um, and I know Urshula to be a really, um, she's going to not like me for saying this, but really a genius. And what I mean by genius is that she combines her design expertise uh, with a really deep knowledge of how people look at things, of why they should look at different things a different way, um, and she opens up new possibilities for delivering content. And someone who can unite those considerations is really um, just a, an amazing asset to have as a museum. But I'm also going to introduce her formally and tell you a little bit about her design studio here in Applied. Um, Ursula and her partner Paul Carlos uh, founded Pure and Pie in 2002 on the strength of their long collaboration, um, in part because they were both the beneficiaries of the free education offered by the Cooper Union. They remain committed to amplifying the contributions of historic New York institutions that continue to present remarkable services. Uh, Pure and Pie has made its primary work what they call uh, projects for the good, or projects that enrich communities and provide lasting civic benefits. Uh, their approach is informed by the history and the makeup of their own studio. So tonight we're going to be focusing on memory of our alleged ghetto photographs of Henry Ross. Uh, but there are many places throughout this building that have um, been uh, reinvigorated and inspired by Pure and Applied. So as you kind of watch through the exhibitions, you've seen some of Ursula's work. And it's my pleasure to be able to introduce her in person now. Thank you. so much for coming tonight. I, I confess to not being used to using microphones, so please just raise a hand or, or uh, give a shout out if I'm uh, straying too far away from that. You can't hear me. Um, so uh, I was asked to speak about the design process of Memory Unearthed, um, and what I wanted to give you was sort of a mix of how um, our studio and uh, approaches designing an exhibition Try to put that in a context and some of the things that we look at. Um, I will, I'm happy to entertain questions sort of as we go along or have questions at the end. But just to get a sense of from the audience, is anybody here at all experienced or familiar with having designed museum exhibitions or exhibitions of any kind? Someone? Okay. Uh, well, so I'll. I'll uh, try and make it as clear as possible and then accessible as possible. And, um, and you know, excuse me in advance if I get into any, any jargon, just feel free to ask me to clarify something. So, um, there are sort of larger and smaller contexts to get into uh, working in exhibition design. We do a lot of other things aside from exhibitions. We do books and manuals and websites and that sort of thing. But in particular with exhibitions, because it's three-dimensional design, and we often have multiple exhibitions going on or are in the process of being designed at a time, um, you've got a lot of different kinds of content. So while we were working on Memory Unearthed, we were working at the New York Public Library an exhibition that's open right now called um, You Say You Want a Revolution, remember in the 60s. Um, we were also working on an exhibition called Waterfront at the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is down at their satellite location in Dumbo. And we were working at the Library of Congress in DC on an exhibition on the history of baseball called Baseball Americana. So I note that because this is the NYPL exhibition, so you're dealing with a lot of different kinds of content simultaneously and different aesthetic approaches and really trying to figure out what's appropriate to the subject matter. So this is all about the 60s. Um, it's plywood, it's very colorful, it's in the 7,000 square foot Goddesson Gallery at the main branch of the library. At Dumbo, the Brooklyn Historical Society and the History of the Waterfront, a very different kind of exhibition. This is actually sort of semi-prominent, probably will be up for about five years or so. Um, and really on the history of the 
the working waterfront and many aspects that are, may no longer be evident today. For instance, if the East River was now twice as wide as it is currently. Um, and, and, and different kinds of audiences um, in terms of expectations. So they studied who might go to this, and it's a large proportion of children. Many in strollers and that sort of thing. So this is a magnetic board where kids can actually sort of design their own local waterfront. So very different kinds of psychology to the spaces and subject matter. And then again, the baseball exhibition uh, in DC, uh, an enormous slice essentially of a, a stadium and laying out the, the story of um, baseball, baseball Americana, the library has one of the richest collections of early baseball material, um, probably of any. Then I think, so, uh, you know, so those kinds of projects are going on at the same time as designing memory on Earth. The other important thing is, um, depending on the content and sort of the context of the story, is being sensitive to how you're going to actually approach that and which images get selected and how they get used and how the information gets presented. Um, so just thinking back on an earlier experience that we had working on projects, we used to work um, uh, at the Center for Jewish History, and that's actually where I met Miriam and Michael Quickman, who heads this uh, institution. And uh, we were approached probably back in 2007, and often when you're asked to design something, there's no necessarily final title. People often just say a subject matter. So when we did something on lunch hour in New York City, they just said we're going to do an exhibition on food. Um, when we did this exhibition on Raphael Lemkin, um, basically the man who coined the term genocide and who lobbied the UN um, for the passage of the resolution um, to prevent and um, I'm not going to forget, I'm not going to remember the proper wording, but basically lobbied the UN so that countries would sign on and be held responsible if they committed genocide. Um, it, it was an exhibition on Lemkin and, and genocide. So you hear that and, and I think for anybody, what the subject matter is, probably images come to mind about what that exhibition might be, at least before you've seen anything. Um, so interestingly, the curator said, whatever happens, we're not going to have images of genocide on the walls. This is a celebration of Lung Kim. This is an understanding of the legal work of one man's effort to actually um, codify what that crime was, and then to get it recognized and addressed. Um, so, this is a little fuzzy. Oh, sorry. Oh, you, you, as long as I'm not in it, you're <laughs> So, uh, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, that CGH and its partners probably had about 5,000 letters or pieces of ephemera in their collection. They had one or two pictures of Len Kitten from my part of his. They had one or two audio recordings. They had a necktie that a, uh, one of his management students had held on to, a book or two, um, and a CBS interview. That, that was the extent of the materials. So the challenge here was how do you bring this story to life um, if what you've mostly got are letters? Um, so, and, and that you're, you're specifically being given instruction not to use photographs of you know, the result of the acts or the results of, of genocide. So um, someone works with a curatorial team and other members of the museum and comes up with strategies to try and make that a spatial experience. And I have to say, it's probably more challenging these days because, um, you know, regardless of the subject matter, because people have higher standards of what they expect as an experience. So, uh, in years gone by, when everybody was okay with text panels and some large graphic images on the wall, that was one thing. But um, as media changes and ways of delivering content change, people tend to be expecting something that's you know, more curiosity provoking, uh, surprising, uh, dimensional, that people like to touch things, they like to read things, there's all sorts of different interactions. Um, and so this is now, like I said, I think, 2007, 
Um, but we had to figure out a relatively cost-effective way to bring that story to life. So we designed a long desk. And it's hard to see from here, but the original items were actually displayed under the desk. We made something like 3,000 replica letters that hung from the ceiling and that basically sort of made a line between a large picture of the UN, which is at the end there, and a picture of Lemkin we don't see who's on this wall. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that in that particular project, you were not to use uh, photographs. Yes. Yet they probably just saw uh, the bowls of photographs. How do you decide, in a case like what we just saw, uh, which of the photographs would be useful, uh, how many to use and not uh, do it uh, you know, overly, right. and uh, which of the photographs are suitable to have enlarged as slides? So when you're saying what you just saw it in memory of Earth? Yeah. So, uh, so if you can sit tight for a minute, I'll get to that because we'll, we'll go through it. Yeah. Uh, so, so I didn't want to, um, I wanted to spend most of the time on memory on Earth, but I'm happy to do this. So, uh, so the replica letters um, uh, was sort of a conceptual idea about him basically sitting in a typewriter, uh, crafting and mailing thousands of letters. This is how he um, lobbied the UN back in the days when basically his tool was a typewriter. Right? He had graduate students doing research for him on the statistics and the impact of genocidal acts. Um, but it was really the typewriter of those letters that persuaded people all over the world to support uh, the resolution on genocide. But, so we, so we knew we set at a desk. We had an idea about the typewriter he used. What we did was actually What we, what we did was we populated the desk with empty red file folders, symbolic of all of those who died in genocidal acts but had never been recorded or acknowledged. Right, so there were aspects of this, and, and, and I'm happy to explain more uh, at the end. I don't want to get into it too much, but uh, a lot of it was to, um, so it, it's, it's good if people get the meaning behind all of it at the same time it's also and it's often a dose of lead tour for the exhibition but there are um, con conceptual moves that we made to try and populate the space because it was tricky to try and name people or again have photographs and then it being explicitly in the brief that we were given as something we shouldn't do. I don't know if that helps but it's one long exaggerated desk with his chair
material is portrayed and the kinds of material uh, that is shown is probably a little different from a history museum such as this or American Museum of Natural History or Brooklyn Historical Society that get more into artifacts and more into ephemera and other contextual items. Um, both these institutions tend to do more of a traditional art show in the wall. So this, just to give an idea, is there were a few images online of how the installation looked elsewhere. So I believe this is in Boston. And then uh, I believe this is Ontario on the left and then Boston again on the right. So many of the same materials, but, but because the Museum of Jewish Heritage um, has a different means of storytelling or approach to storytelling that wants to draw on survivor testimonies, written documents, and other pieces of ephemera. Um, it really was um, enriched and pre uh, presented more as a sort of history exhibition that was photography rich. Um, the other thing that came along with this, which doesn't always, is an existing identity. So different institutions find different ways, we would now normally call it branding, uh, not really that on that word, but um, uh, of coming up with an identity, a typeface, a look, and a color palette for an exhibition. Um, so this was the one that was used at the MFA in Boston. Um, you know, and I think what's fascinating is to, I, I, it's been a while, but I used to teach design, and I think what's fascinating is to try and kind of unpack or, or analyze certain choices that were made. So, uh, sort of a distressed typeface, right? Perhaps suggesting that something had been unearthed or had been aged or worn. Um, a typewriter type font um, that's connected to the time period. And uh, for those of you that have seen the exhibition already, um, a suggestion of a rectangle, which probably references the box that the negatives were found in, but though it's not don't be certain, right? But, um, so I think all good. Uh, I think all good directions. Um, one thing we wanted to do here, because we were adding more uh, new materials to the exhibition, was to think about having it have a new or refreshed look. And we also wanted to think about how we interpreted the materials or what was in the work. So this is not the final uh, identity for the exhibition, but from the presentations that and uh, sort of workshop meetings that we had with the museum, we were doing explorations of, of different ways of um, suggesting something about the content. So there's a reference here to negative film, like photographic negative film, with um, how the memory and the work is knocking out here, the slope. Was something about the reference of the unearthing, the typography, specifically that typeface, even if it was very contemporary, um, was something as close as you could find um, that was actually being used in one of the documents that was in the exhibition. Um, you know, there was a reference again to negatives here, and there were attempts to try it horizontally. So, so the process is not completely linear. A lot of these uh, design decisions and explorations overlap. So the other thing that we're looking at and that we're sort of given in this case is an existing catalog. Um, and I think even book design, if we're not talking about, you know, as compared to spatial design, is a kind of an interesting thing to, to think about with the cover. I'm not sure how many of you have seen the exhibition catalog. That, that already existed, so we didn't design that. It ended up being a resource for us. But what's, what's interesting is that's where I'll show on the cover. Um, you don't actually see, until you open the book out flat, what he's actually photographed, right? And then, and then I think it's also useful to think of a step back for a moment and ask for someone else what other information is giving you, because obviously somebody's photographing him, right? So there were other photographers, actually, uh, that were working and that some other kind of photographs had managed to survive from the video as well. Um, the other thing that we look at uh, is really um, the content, so the objects. So in this 
case, and like I said, sometimes we're just given a few paragraphs, but in this case, it was an existing object list. And in general, um, we, have, again, we're given a brief to use and incorporate every object, and then enrich it with objects from uh, a GH is collected. So, you know, different columns, and this is how we're getting the material, and I just thought it would be nice to show you the 19 pages of exhibition material. Because even if it seems like a lot in space, perhaps it doesn't seem like this many items, but it's actually quite a few items that one has to begin to understand, process, and figure out how that's actually going to be arranged in three dimensions for people to follow. What's the red, the red line? Uh, so um, those were flight questions. So sometimes uh, uh, the institution or we as designers will either add a column with a sort of query column or call things out if it hasn't totally been settled. You find yourself often checking, double checking, triple checking, and quadruple checking dimensions. Um, another thing that is sort of a given is whatever happens before in the space. So I'm not sure how many of you came to see the show on Operation Finale, um, but if it's an ins institution with regular visitorship, then it's also just something to keep at the back of one's mind what came before and what was the last thing people saw. Um, so in this case, uh, and I'll just be sort of analytical about this, photographic imagery, um, probably rather arresting and, uh, um, and perhaps a little bit shocking when one first sees it, uh, and red, black, and white. Um, so we keep that in the back of our mind in terms of what the treatment is going to be for the next exhibition. The other thing you're given is the gallery itself. So Schneider Gallery, as we deal with it in um, design, um, everyday design work, and when we're at the studio as opposed to here, is often dealt in floor plan form. So this is the entrance, right? And so that um, large uh, rapid that you saw, oops, flanked, flanked over right here. And then this whole area is the gallery, and we're in here. So given those materials, um, then we look for inspiration. So we, we know um, the objects in our story. We have a little bit of an idea from reading the catalog what the larger story is, but we have to figure out, OK, we're, we're distilling aspects of that. And what can we actually fit in the space without overwhelming people? Um, some studies have shown that the average visitor only spends about 16 minutes in an exhibition. But there's different types of visitors. So some people will read it start to finish and, and absorb absolutely everything. Other people, little white bees, the flowers, will pick and choose, right? So it really, and then, and then there's other people that like particular kinds of uh, media and, and perhaps go to those. So with Ross, um, it was evident from the catalog and from discussions with the museum um, that there were a couple main inspirations. One was the photo of the negatives actually being retrieved. Um, which was remarkable that that existed. And then also his own words. So I buried my negatives in the ground in order that there should be some record of our tragedy. I was anticipating the total destruction of Polish Jewry. I wanted to leave a historical record of our martyrdom. Uh, so taken together, those two things were really powerful. Um, and, and we asked ourselves, all right, so we've got quite a bit of space, we have these materials, now how do we start to try and convey the power of those things? Uh, we don't have a book, we've got space. It ends up laying out very differently. Um, so we're taking something that's two-dimensional and trying to interpret it for three-dimensional space. Um, now, getting back to the practical, what we, what we tend to do is we work with floor plans and then we render them. So sometimes in early stages, it's as generic looking as this, right? So here, I'm actually standing looking into the second gallery from the first gallery. 
gallery. So things change, so that's the film that uh, filtered it out. But this uh, gives um, the museum and the client some idea. We have dozens of these shots from different angles. What the feeling of the space is going to be. We also start to layer in what the important key images are and elements. So we thought about, again, I showed you what was at Boston, and it was a photograph of text. We thought about how, how do we dimensionalize the power of the words or the retrieval of those negatives that survived. And so our initial idea was that we might have a pedestal with a glow on top with Ross's words actually here on top. Um, juxtaposed with the photo of him finding, or not finding, but actually um, retrieving the, the negatives. Yeah. Yep. It appears that this is the genetic um, So this might get a little wonky. They're, they're SCGs. That's silicon edge graphic. It's a fabric print, and it's rear illuminated. So there's actually a strip of LED lighting around the four sides of that box. Um, and the way it has reflected film on the back, it bounces the light, so it all appears to be glow. Well, it is glow. Well. Is it done the same way in all these situations? No, but so the thing is that it depends on what it is, because if you've got some distance between your image and, and that um, screen or fabric, it could actually be a projector. Um, in this case, they're static images, because of the box is only about Yay, deep, four or five inches. Um, so it's just a static image that's printed. Um, but in many places, if it's a moving image, then it's actually a rear projection. How much does it feel like that? Um, so, <laughs> and so it depends a bit, but I'm going to say maybe $1,500 to $2,000, depending on its size and how many proofs and that kind of thing that you go through. Um, and actually, so I'm glad you pointed out the SCGs because, uh, and I'm probably going to skip around a little bit, but uh, so we thought about photography and, and Ross and how light on the negative like, photographs are made by exposure to light. Um, unearthing the box had a sort of a idea of bringing that back into the light, um, preserving the memory of the crimes uh, that had been committed, um, sort of brought to mind the idea of shedding light on history, right? So we felt like there was this very powerful argument around the way he was like. Um, we also thought that um, if there was one small gentle critique we could make in previous institutions, that much of Ross's work was still in negative or contact sheet form, so it's tiny. Um, so we asked ourselves, is there a way that we could um, bring scale to it, bring light to it, um, so, so visitors didn't have to squint in quite as many small images that there will be those visitors that will look at every one, but there will also be school groups and other groups going through, maybe on a, not as much time or what have you, and how do we make sure that everybody sees key, powerful imagery? So the SEGs let us do that. They let us also keep the light levels low in the gallery, so for any objects that are originals that aren't supposed to be exposed, um, we were able to have quite dark areas, and then moments of light that helped us sort of draw people around. Um, this also started to show the evolution of how that lit box went to more of a platform. Um, we started thinking about the idea of unearthing, and so what we ended up with was a projection that goes through a very slow slideshow of uh, sort of disappearing and then revealing images. Um, so rather than just a static moment of his words, we sort of wanted to show those images as they appeared, right? So they're coming up from the platform um, and referencing <coughs> how, how the negatives were unearthed. You know, and sometimes we go too far. We try, we try this. Uh, you look at it and realize that oh, that's way too much. Uh, and it's not sort of parsing out the information in a, in a sort of good paced way. Um, and then we are able to share with the clients all sorts of views so they can understand the navigation of the gallery. So again, this is an earlier version where we have the glowing box. But it's not that different because you're walking in here. You're seeing the, the glowing image here on the platform. 
Um, and then in this business unit, um, and you know that, uh, when the contact sheets are shown is different, but you get the idea. Um, but we go through multiple stages and we work through how people enter, circulate, and approach room to room. And then we get into uh, maybe what you would consider some more technical aspects. Um, measurements for just about everything that could be in the gallery. So we know things fit. So we know when we have decorators build things because we don't build uh, anything. Uh, that everything's actually going to be able to be accommodated in the gallery. That we can um, make sure that we've met ADA, ADA guidelines. Um, so passageways and everything else are accessible. And then again, it goes even further. Electrical and where the outlets are, where projections are, where radio is, anything that we need that makes the various AV and other elements in the, in the um, exhibition function. So we're looping back a little bit to storytelling in the lobby. Um, before when we were talking about that image of um, Operation Finale. So at some point in the process, we're also we're thinking, okay, that's what's there right now, but what might replace it and what image could we use? So maybe I'll put this to all of you. If this is our entryway, and then we selected these as possible very powerful images to use there, we, we didn't end up with any of those. Um, any any uh, any thoughts on why? If you're looking at the the entry and the photographs, why 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 we didn't end up? There, there were very practical reasons. There were a number of reasons, but very practical reasons, uh, considerations why we didn't actually use any of the photos. Any any guesses? So that's one of them, right? We, that we wanted, sorry, go ahead. Oh, that if you had any of those images on the entry wall, that you'd be maybe revealing, giving away too much before one enters. So, that, so that's one consideration, and, and it's true. You don't, you know, depending on the power of the image, you often want to save the storytelling until you're inside the gallery. Um, the, the other one was that we wanted to be sensitive, that. Uh, these are um, records um, and images, uh, many containing people uh, that lost their lives in the ghetto or in camps later on, and, and we didn't necessarily want them to feel like they were, you know, I don't want to say decoration, but just surrounding a doorway like that. We wanted to be respectful. But it's also the case that in photography, when they're in portraits, um, often the people are at the center of the portrait and our doorways at the center, right? And we, we soon realized that no matter how much we tried to maybe move the images around, we were going to lose important information. So um, so what we ended up doing was actually taking a, a print of what was basically a completely, uh, I don't want to say completely ruined, but a, a negative with no representational image on it, but still had the water damage um, that was common to many of the others. Um, so we could feature our title because we also don't want to put text willy nilly over um, portraits of people, right? So we were keeping all those things in consideration as we put this together. And then we also thought about the different, and I'll just flip back and forth, uh, the different ways that people would approach and what you might see first. And then you know, a glimpse of the unearthing photo through the door. Um, and so now we move back to the discussion about what the identity is. And so I, I, I couldn't quite tell you which came first, but I, my recollection is that the entry wall came first. Um, but then what we ended up using is the show's identity, or you could call it logo if you want uh, more common terminology. Um, were these variations, and we have always have to do variations because you never know what's going to work best online or in a printed brochure or in the different contexts that it might need to be used. And then storytelling. So again, demonstrating to the, 
the museum, how we might actually have this story told. And again, the, the proportions and, and the images that are shown are not quite what ends up being there. And we have the title wall on the right hand side, which is not what the treatment ended up being. Um, but you see the very constructive photo and the whole reason that Ross was actually able to um, uh, have extra film to be able to document secretly people's lives um, is sort of already in place there. And then installation photos that show what is now actually uh, the exhibition. And again, that whole idea of the glowing image that's almost at life size so that anybody walking through, no matter whether they're reading the text or not, um, is getting part of the story because um, our sort of approach, whether it's in books or in spaces, is that people take in different kinds of information and the images should tell their own abbreviated story as well. Right? Some people uh, sort of, um, naturally gravitate more towards imagery, but whatever the text, the images, the spaces, the pacing, the color on the walls, the angle of the walls, those should all contribute and underscore the, the overall feeling uh, that you're trying to evoke. Um, and then just to point out that uh, together with the museum, we added in additional information. So in the original two exhibitions, there was no timeline. And to my knowledge, there was not a map or if there was a map, it much more simplified that. So timeline, so that visitors are able to situate themselves where in the story, and then a map. And those two things, obviously very important as the exhibit unfolds, but the timeline was quite um, uh, lengthy, and so we positioned uh, portions of the timeline, timeline throughout the gallery so that people were able to actually check with that, um, so that they understood what events were happening there. Um, and getting a little bit more towards the additional objects that the museum added, so I just covered this. Um, uh, uh, Miriam, um, who was really sort of in charge of enhancing the exhibition and turning it more into an exhibition focused on uh, the historical, uh, was really the one writing the timeline and, and figuring out how that storytelling would happen. Um, a collaborative effort on the map so that one could actually plot out key locations um, in the ghetto, uh, and this was its own challenge um, because of uh, historical maps at the time, either being in German or Polish, or conflicting uh, naming on the maps. So this actually took quite a bit of effort to, uh, to pull this together. Um, and then MJH objects that were used to um, really um, augment the more photographic storytelling. So there's a whole process of looking at the existing object list and then going through the collections of MJH and pulling out artifacts that relate and help to um, uh, help to elaborate upon what was happening at the time. So that's really more of a curatorial and exhibition effort that goes on at the library, uh, sorry, the library, at the museum, but it's something that uh, we are necessarily involved with it because we have to design cases that keep those things safe. Um, and then there's different types of artifacts uh, with different levels of need that go into the exhibition. So the cases are designed um, in, you know, in relation to sort of strict um, conservation standards. Um, some of the artwork came already framed, as in the box frames that you see there on the wall, but needed to be repainted so it matched our um, color scheme. Um, and then a very interesting thing that um, AGO, uh, the originating institution, did, I mean, they recognized that contact sheets are small. So they made reproductions that just get into the wall. So treated in a less precious manner, but really, uh, really with the um, objective that they're easier for the visitor to sort of scrutinize and get up close to. Are those ID documents in the cases mm -hmm. originals? They are. Why is there a triangle cut out of the That might be a good question. What, I'm sorry, what was the question? 
Are those identification documents that are in the cases yes. closed? You know, because the originals, it looks like we were just trying to flag each one. Oh, I think in the other cases. So. Not this case. No, the other, oh, the other case, sorry. Yeah, so, um, so everyone in the other had an ID, and the Jewish people in the ghetto had an ID that identified them as Jewish prisoners in the ghetto, and I think that's... Well, it looks like each one had a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. you, you're saying that the triangle indicated that... an identification marker, like what kind of ID they had. It's, it's purposeful. Um, and, and then um, going back again to the large and fat lit imagery, um, we, we really tried to position that so it drew people through the sections and, uh, and, and represent it as much as it could in the section um, and what that storytelling was about. So it moved through different kinds of imagery. Um, you know, and, and the other thing is obviously there's a lot of uh, photos to choose from. Um, there was also a sensitivity that we probably didn't, that we, when we knew that we didn't want to put anything too graphic on the walls, that that kind of material is probably better off viewed um, sort of uh, uh, in a more uh, kind of intimate setting um, so that people have more of a choice as to whether they want to engage. Again, when, um, when we're talking about trying to tell the story both through the large images and through the smaller images, we want to be cognizant of the fact that, that there might be imagery that people choose not to want to say and make their own look at. Um, and then um, the film booth that uh, actually had interview footage with Ross. Um, a few other, other uh, shots of um, his original negative sheets. Um, and as we move into the third room, um, uh, we have a backlit image of the deportation uh, photo. Um, you know, and, and, and this goes maybe more broadly for exhibitions that we do, but we keep in mind that today, obviously with smartphones, a lot of people want to document a lot of different aspects of the exhibitions for themselves. So sometimes they're taking it because they want to have a shot of the whole room, but other people obviously go in and, and want to photograph because there's something about the information that's relevant and they, and they want to keep it either for sort of memory's sake or even for research purposes. Um, and then throughout the exhibit in different places from the entry to this last room, um, the museum was able to provide audio testimony of survivors. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. And, and again, uh, other thinking about different size AV installations and whether there's sound bleed or not. Um, it goes into the realm of the more practical, but it becomes tricky as to uh, what has open audio and what has closed audio and how many people are going to choose to watch it. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, a, a slight departure that we took from the, the two other institutions who had chosen to put the composition of the um, portraits that you see here sort of flat up on the wall. Um, we wanted visitors to walk into the room and not necessarily see these final portraits, um, and then to come around this structure um, and, and see them um, uh, presented all together um, and really have this be the one thing that one looked at as opposed to maybe a wall that you can see from a distance before you even approached it um, to try and pace the um, experience. Um, and, then, and then just thinking about um, what lasts, because an awful lot of the exhibitions that we do are temporary. Um, there's the exhibition catalog, which uh, we looked at before, um, and then often we're tasked with making exhibition um, brochures or other associated uh, pieces of ephemera, and it needs to look and have the look and feel of the exhibition itself. Um, and it's something to think about that um, even though you know it's a small brochure and, and modest, uh, that uh, a lot of what 
we see in exhibitions today um, was maybe a newspaper or some other form or what have you that uh, people at the time just like, thought was going to be thrown away, thrown away or discarded, um, and that this is the kind of thing uh, that gets preserved for posterity. So thankfully, we have a lot more photography and ability to, to save um, and videotape um, the exhibition that's put up uh, for posterity, but the most sort of um, uh, simple and modest thing that you own or you pick up might actually be uh, treasured and displayed years from now. One needs to think about that sometimes.